<laughs> All right. Well, with that in mind, uh, I, I do want to, again, thank everybody that's with us tonight and thank Martha and Vanessa for taking the time uh, to chat natural wine with us tonight and also uh, for just being willing to do this, uh, this whole uh, kind of online tasting virtual Zoom experience of wine education is very new, and but I think it's something that we're all going to have to get pretty comfortable with going forward in, uh, in the years ahead. So thank you guys so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, it's really fun, the online wine thing. I mean, you actually get to have a little longer format discussion, and I, I like nerding out about wine, and sometimes <laughs> when you're in a big tasting and it's loud, you end up, you know, just talking about more of the the birds and like, like the birds and the weather and I don't know what else, <laughs> but it's fun to dive in. Yeah. Well, um, I want to give you guys uh, a full chance to kind of introduce yourselves, introduce the, the wineries um, and just kind of before we do that, I do want to frame tonight, like we are, we're talking about natural wine, uh, which is a subject I've actually talked about with each of you individually. Uh, and we've had really great conversations, which is exactly why you were the first two that came to mind uh, for us to do Aww. this with. So because, sweet. well, you know, it's funny. I, I, the first podcast I did at Weinster was actually with Shant over at Leilun. And, uh, you know, we had a great time, lots of really engaging conversation. We didn't agree on everything, which was amazing. And then like a month later, uh, I'm hanging out with, uh, Aaron Cherney and Randy Feldman from Source and Sing. And they're like, yeah, we heard you got in a big argument with Shant about natural wines. Like, do you have it recorded somewhere? I was like, wait, what are you talking about? And they're like, yeah, like somebody told us that you guys got it. So I, I just want to preface this of, uh, I am not here to play devil's advocate. I'm not going to push back. I uh, have had a revelation in the last year and a half of around the world of natural wines, which uh, Vanessa, I know you in particular, and I have had a lot of talks about this. So yeah. I'm excited for tonight. I'm excited about these wines. Uh, and really tonight should be, uh, if everybody at home has questions, submit them, submit them. Like, uh, let's, let's get the discussion going. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I think uh, Martha, we'll just start with you because you arrived first, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> She's a winemaker. <laughs> right, right. So uh, yeah, uh, introduce yourself, the wines, uh, everything. Yeah, so my name is Martha Stuman and um, I own Martha Stuman Wines. Very creative on the naming there. Um, I, uh, let's see, started making wine in 2006 when I went to, uh, right after I graduated undergrad and went to work on a farm in Italy and they put me in the vineyard and the winery and it was a really traditional farm. And so, um, the way they made wine was, was very traditional, um, which is actually very, very, very similar to the way people make natural wine. So before, you know, before kind of the industrialization of wine, natural wine, traditional wine, it was all the same. So, um, yeah, and now I started my business in 2014. So that was my first vintage, uh, making wine for myself. Just prior to that, I was the assistant winemaker at Brock. So it's all in the family here. Definitely. Uh, take it away, Vanessa. Oh, so um, <laughs> yeah. So I uh, was at Brock when Martha worked there and she was like uh, just a total inspiration. And actually I, I started working at Brock like it'll be six years ago in January. And um, it was my first job back in the job market after having uh, my my daughter. I have two kids now. Um, and honestly, it was working in the tasting room and it was, I really got into wine by drinking wine. And my previous career before I had my daughter was in, in investment services. Basically, I did marketing for an investment advisory firm. It was totally soul sucking. I drank way too much crappy wine, but luckily I lived in the dog patch and there was this wine bar called Yield Wine Bar. And at the time, um, this was 2012. So um, it's kind of a while ago. They called it not natural wine. They called it green wine. So I don't know if Martha remembers this little period where they called it green wine. Um, and he, uh, Chris Tavelli, who owns um, Yield Wine Bar, was the one that introduced me to this concept of 
oh yeah, organic grapes, low intervention, native fermentation. And so from there, I just kept kind of exploring and drinking it. Fast forward to a few years later, I started my own business um, doing wine gifts online that were that were actually um, supposed to be like natural wine gifts. Um, and what's funny, it was right around the time Winestar started. Um, and so, uh, so history really kind of parallels itself. But fast forward, I started working after having my da daughter one day a week in the tasting room um, and at Brock and really got more introduced one-on-one -on -one to what went into winemaking um, and also learned just a lot about kind of what natural wine meant and really solidified my ideas about it. My like slack is popping up and it's really annoying me, sorry. Um, and so, um, and it was just like this aha moment, like I have to always drink wine like this. And so then I just kept drinking wine and loving wine. And now today, I actually, this year during the pandemic started my own business. I have to tell them to stop flacking me because I don't, I literally don't know how to turn it off. Wait, I think I could just close it. Okay, there we go. This is, this is um, the, the thing that everybody's been going through the last couple of months. It's like <laughs> having so many devices where people can reach us. I'm really sorry. I was getting to this part, which actually during the pandemic. So in 2017, I also started working with another big winery um, that Brock actually introduced me to. And I was kind of doing this hybrid thing. And during the pandemic, it really solidified the situation where I needed to figure out what I was doing with my life kind of. Um, and I actually started my own business. So now Brock is a client, which, and I love them. They're so amazing. I was super nervous. I was like, are you, can you still hire me? You know? And they were like, of course, like whatever you want. And that was really sweet and like wonderful. Um, and so, um, yeah, my business is basically supporting direct to consumer, uh, channel for small wineries. And it's, they're all obviously all natural, natural wineries is the only what I'm willing to work with and what I love um, and I'm passionate about and building small winemakers. So that's kind of that's kind of my story. There's obviously so much more and I could talk forever. So I'm going to stop now. But um, I love Brock. I love their wine. And I got into wine by drinking wine. I think that's kind of such a common denominator of so many of us who found our, our way in the industry is that we drank enough of this stuff that we had to figure out more and we had to learn more. And then all of a sudden we're like, wait, people actually get paid to have this in their lives. And, you know, you go home one holiday season, you're trying to tell somebody, yeah, I'm like kind of in the wine business. And they're like, that's not a real job. Uh, and then you wake up, you know, years later and, and here we are. Uh, yeah. So yeah, exactly. You can love <laughs> wine so much. You, you decide that you have to make it yourself in order to like, you know, keep up with the, with the inventory. Other people Absolutely. drink my wine too, not just me, but like, <laughs> it's definitely, it's an incentive. Exactly. <laughs> uh, well, I think a great transition into the wines themselves that we're enjoying tonight is actually a question that we had come in from Noah. Uh, he says that, uh, I've never heard of these grapes. Where are they from? And look, that part of the reason why we picked these wines uh, in particular um, are because Look, not only are they natural wines, not only are they delicious, but uh, these grapes in particular are, for me, very much speaking to so much of the natural wine movement right now, uh, and I guess maybe even historically, but, you know, uh, I don't know how many natural wine Cabernet Sauvignon Napa Valley wines there are, uh, not like the most on the market. Uh, it's not heavily focused on Pinot Noir from Russian River Valley. Uh, part of this kind of seems to be uh, exploring the fringes a little bit and and really the idea of exploring exploring it all uh, and these two great varieties in particular really represent that so with that in mind uh, Martha I think we'll start with you just kind of talk us through uh, Nerodabla as a grape variety but also really about uh, this wine what went into this wine where the grapes are from uh, etc I'll kind of let you take it from there Absolutely. I hope you're all ready to geek out on Nerodabla because I love the grape so much um so Nerodavla, where do I start? Um, it is originally from Sicily. It is kind of to Sicily what Zinfandel is to California. So pretty ubiquitous, kind of pretty, goes hand in hand with the Italian, um, or the Sicilian wine identity is, is this grape Nerodavla. I um, went, so 
you know, in my intro, I told you I started in Italy. I, that was in Tuscany where I was working on this farm in 2006. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to, I guess it was 2014 was my first year at Brock. But in between that time period, I went and I did a, a long series of apprenticeships um, around the world. So that was about eight years of apprenticing um, before I started my own business. And one of the most really the most impactful places was Sicily, but I, um, that was a little bit later in my kind of eight years of apprenticeship. So at first it was just like, oh, I want to explore. I want to learn everything there is to make wine. Um, I would drink a wine. I think like one of my first apprenticeships was in Germany and I will get to the Naradavla thing, I promise, but <laughs> a little circuitous. So it was in Germany because I, I drank this like delicious Riesling, off dry Riesling at home once. And I immediately started writing producers who I wanted, who I had researched and wanted to work for. Um, so at first it was kind of this bit of discovery, but then as I went along in these internships, they became more and more focused and more and more purposeful. And I thought, I'm from California and I thought if I ever want to return to California, I should start working in places that really have a similar climate. And I know California is really varied, but a lot of California is pretty warm <laughs> and a lot of California is, is a lot more like Sicily than, than Burgundy. Don't tell any of the Pinot producers here, but <laughs> it's true. So, um, you know, I started working in the south of France and then I went to work in Sicily and they, they have this amazing grape, Naradavla. It was also happened to be one of the very first natural wines I'd ever, I ever had, not knowing that it was a natural wine. And I was just like, so in love with the flavors, which is, you know, the reason you fall in love with wine, not all the other stuff, but um, went to work for this place. And, and when I was there, I learned, not only do I love the flavor of the grape, but it has really amazing characteristics. So if you're like me and you're trying to grow grapes with fewer inputs, especially on the farming side of things, you know, you start to consider all these strange factors that you wouldn't think about, like how loose is the cluster? So that means like how tightly packed are the grapes on the cluster? Because the number one problem with grapes is that, um, they have like the Achilles heel of grapes is mildew, which is a fungal pathogen. So if you don't have airflow through the cluster, then you have to spray a lot more of these fungicides. So that was one of the things. I also wanted to work in warmer parts of California, again, because there's less mildew pressure. So that's the main thing we have to spray against in a vineyard is mildew. And so, if you're in an area where there's just the conditions are low, there's not a lot of like kind of 80 degree weather and humidity, then you're pretty in the clear, you know, you might have to do one or two applications of really like softer, much softer and kind of more natural chemistries. But so for me, I was like, okay, I need to be in a hot climate. What is a grape that I can grow there that won't just flab out like that won't just like fall apart in the heat and won't and will become like the, where all the acidity will go away and it, it won't have this like vibrancy that I really look for in wine so Naradavla fit the bill it has beautiful natural acidity even in hot hot climates um, it also has just enough tannin which is a great natural preservative in wine tannin and acidity are your two like main natural preservatives. So if you're not adding a lot of sulfur and, um, so yeah, I mean, long story short, sure. I fell in love with the flavor of this grape and it, I found it so compelling. It has kind of this, um, I don't know, it's hard. It's between, it's not quite as like savory as a Syrah, but it has a little bit of that kind of wild characteristic, um, medium body it goes with so many different types of food and, and just, you know, but the further I went down that trail, the more and more I realized that like, this is, this fits so many of the, check, checks so many of the boxes for me in terms of the way I like to make wine and grow grapes. So. Flab out is a phrase that I'm stealing, but Flab not out. for like, yeah. but not in the wine space. I'm going to use, I'm going to find somewhere else to use flab out somehow, some way. Um, I'm not doing my Peloton today. I'm just going to flab out. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, because you only do Peloton if you post that on Instagram. Those are the rules. If you, oh, if you didn't okay. do that, then, yeah, right. Like uh, that's what I've been told at least. Um, okay. No, there, there's something that you said that um, I want to point out real quick because uh, a lot of a lot of times on these zooms we have had winemakers that are working with Pinot Noir, they're working with Cab, that are working with Tempranillo or, or something of the sort. And they've talked about finding more cool climate uh, growing areas. And specifically because you mentioned at the beginning how so much of uh, California is so warm, how the climate here isn't like Burgundy. It isn't, most of it at least isn't like the Northern Rhone so much as the Southern Rhone. And so like the, everybody's always looking for something cooler and something uh, a little bit closer to the coast and yet you mentioned that you do the opposite yeah you do you do look for warmth uh and how that can uh kind of influence the decisions that you don't need to make in, in the vineyard so much so i guess my question is uh you know are the people looking for cool climate vineyards just full of it or, you know are, are they are they are they doing it wrong uh can you make natural wine in in cool climate regions yeah, I mean, I'm quite, so the Loire Valley is like a hotbed for natural wine, but there are certain things that potentially, you know, have to be mitigated that I don't have to deal with. Like, you know, the amount of a type of mildew called downy mildew is really strong there. And so even though they're farming organically, a lot of um, growers will spray copper in addition to natural, like elemental sulfur, which is the only thing I use is elemental sulfur. And even though it's a natural, copper is a natural element, it's still not great building up in our soils over time. So, I mean, I don't know, no farming is perfect. I'm not gonna, you know, pretend that I <laughs> I have all of the answers here, but there are, the cool, cooler climates are challenging. They can produce really, really beautiful fruit and, and certainly in specific varieties, but, you know, I, instead of thinking, instead of selling your, you know, like kind of closing your, closing your mind off and saying, okay, I have to make these varieties that are like the kind of pinnacle varieties that everybody holds up these quote unquote noble varieties, which again can be beautiful, but you know, I think all of that is like an artifact of history anyway. Like we don't know, we don't know as much about Sicilian wine as because like Sicily was poor for much of much of its, its history, or we don't know as much about Georgian wine, even though it's been one of the longest like winemaking, you know, has the longest uninterrupted winemaking history because it was off and on occupied by Russia. Like, so what we get, you know, I don't necessarily say that Pinot is the best grape or Cab is the best grape. A lot of it has to do with history too. And there can be beautiful. So, but I think, you know, saying if I want to like, if I set my my philosophy in a certain way and not to be totally dogmatic, you know, it's, it's a little permeable, but I want to have a pillar where I'm making, you know, this is what I'm, I'm trying to put forth and the practices I'm, I'm practicing. It's then you just have to say, okay, that's, that's the kind of, you know, that's my anchor and how do I pivot around it? And how do I find other varieties that meet those needs and other regions? So, yeah. So Vanessa, if, if yeah. the papacy wasn't relocated to the Rhone Valley and, you know, and it was instead relocated to somewhere in Southwest France, maybe when we wouldn't be drinking Grenache all over the place, we'd be drinking Valdegui. Is, is that what I'm to believe here? You know, uh, is that a reason? Am, am I reasonable to think that? Because I'm totally down for this alternate uh, history where we all drink Valdegui all the time. That sounds really fun to me. <laughs> um, well, it's so funny because I'm just really going to be truthful about like the extent of my wine knowledge. And I really think of Valdigui as uh, what I always heard it being called, which is Napa Valley Gamay. Mm -hmm. I really, I think Valdigui is one of those things that has become very specific to California in many ways. Um, you know, there's a lot of history uh, uh, of Valdigui and it's, a, it's really an unsung hero of wine in many ways. And what's wonderful is kind of this new California wine, which is what Brock Sellers is, is really elevating and expressing Valdigui in a lot of ways um, that haven't really been expressed before, or they're also kind of throwbacks to some of the pioneers of, of Valdigui. Um, and like Jay Lore, that's who I was trying to think of. I was like, oh gosh, am I not going to remember? <laughs> um, he was really just such, he was uh, a huge 
proponent of Valdigui. It was just a juicy, delicious um, grape that he he loved. And a lot of the old plantings that are still around ha are can be directly tied back to his advocacy of the grape. Um, and so Brock Sellers, uh, this the 2017 Valdigui from Brock Sellers is like 65 year vines, year old vines. So these are considered old vines, obviously, um, and they're dry farmed. They're, you know, they're beautiful. They're in the heart of uh, Green Valley from Worth Vineyard. Um, and they use organic practices, um, not certified though. Um, and it's it's a steep slope, really iron rich. So there's definitely some different things coming. Um, it's not just a warm, flat land. Um, and so you get different um, ripening of the grapes and that sort of thing. Um, the 2017, in my opinion, is tasting really great right now. Uh, I love it. When we first released it, it was a little bit green and a little bit had some of that kind of tanniny thing going on. And that's the other thing I love about wine in general is like some of the wines that you release right away are just so tasty and super delicious. And then other ones need to really grow on you. So, you know, as somebody who is coming into my own as like a wine drinker, so to speak, I love learning that about um, different vintages and knowing that just because I tried a 27 Valdigui last year doesn't mean that the 2017 Valdigui isn't going to be good this year. Um, and it's a really fun thing to do. So anytime you want buy wine from Winester, make sure you get a couple bottles, stick one in your cellar, drink one, you know, a couple weeks after you get it, like let it mellow after it's been shipped and, um, and, and try that game. Cause that's like one of my favorite things to do. So if you don't already do that, definitely try it. That's a recommendation of mine. Um, and yeah, so Valdigui is just, um, it's a really interesting, cool grape that is very California these days. And you can find a lot of single varietal Valdigui's. It used to be used a lot as a blending grape because it had that juiciness, you know, some, some, you know, I think kind of in more of my basic days, uh, when I was in the tasting room, I would talk about uh, cherry jelly rancher is one of the tasting notes and but that was something that was very approachable to people they were like oh yeah I, I taste that oh yeah I get that um and so it's one of those wines that can be really nicely paired especially with Thanksgiving meals which I think is one reason why we're tasting these wines because they do go really good with Thanksgiving which is coming up um and you know that it's also such a chillable grape. I mean, I'm just like the, the love of Valdigui is such a cool thing. And I'm really happy that it's becoming something that's a little bit more recognizable by those who are really searching out more unique grapes. And it's same with Nero. I mean, you know, sure, maybe you could find it on an Italian uh, wine list, Italian restaurant wine list, you know, a uh, Sicilian Nero, but it was very hard uh, a few years ago. Martha knows more about this than I do to even find anything grown in California made. Yeah, that was a Nero. So, you know, th this is a very special wine, you know, to have a Nero Davila, to have a Valdigui. These are very special, very rare. And you should think of it that way. Instead of being a disciple of Pinot Noir, which has now been so, so mass produced, um, and it's really easy to find a bad one, like gravitate more to some of these cool grapes because it's much easier to find a good California Nero and a good California Valdigui, you know? I, I kind of look at it like this, you know, to have the guts to push uh, a Nero or Valdigui to market, <laughs> you, you better be damn sure that it's delicious. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you can make 13, $14 Pinot Noir and, you know, it can taste like sugar syrup but it'll sell a lot because it's Pinot Noir. Uh, so there, there's kind of like a, a little bit of a survival of the fittest of like just getting to the, getting this grape to the market shows that, uh, you know, that there's belief in that wine enough that they would put it on the shelf, you know, because for, as somebody who ran wine shops, work at, worked at wine shops, uh, you want to put as many wines on the shelf as possible that'll sell without any effort on your part whatsoever, especially on a Friday night, you're running around, uh, grabbing bottles, ringing people up. You want wines that people just grab and go. Uh, and when you stock your shelves, or in my case, your website, with alternative grape varieties, uh, I think that people at home should really take that even more so as a ringing endorsement uh, of something like that. So we are we are we're talking about uh, these incredible grape varieties that you know we 
I, I feel like every alternative grave variety in some way gets compared to it's like Syrah and this meet somewhere in the middle. It's like, you know, Syrah and Gamay meet in the middle, Syrah and San Giovese meet in the middle, like because of uh, all the different styles of Syrah. And we know that these great alternative grape varieties are very, are heavily featured in the natural wine world uh, and scene. I, I think we should take a step back and uh, try our damnedest to define what natural wine is. It's the you know, I get this question when human beings used to hang out with each other socially. I would get this question all the time from my friends or my wife's friends. I, I get it from cons consumers all the time. Uh, when I do corporate tastings, I get asked about natural wine every single time because it's the most talked about segment of the wine industry, uh, it, it, at least in my experience. And so we'll throw it back to Martha to start. If you had to somehow boil down your definition of what natural wine is to like a sentence or two. I know, I know, I know. It's like the elevator pitch of natural wine. Or, or at the very least, like what are, for you, what is the defining factor uh, or factors that when you look at a wine uh, for, if you're making a wine and you feel comfortable calling it natural, what are the boxes that kind of have to be checked? Yeah, so I guess the... There's, I could like give you a philosophical sentence and, yeah. and then I'll, I'll quickly go into the boxes. But I think the whole premise behind making natural wine is this idea of observing nature and really trying to understand it and working with it. And, um, and, and I think with other, you know, more recent modern winemaking, the idea is to control things to control nature and to have a really consistent outcome. Whereas I think natural wine, the whole idea is to express time, place, site, diversity. So, and a diversity of flavors too. So um, that would be it. But, you know, in terms of like kind of the, the check boxes is, you know, at, at minimum grown um, with organic grapes. Um, uh, some minimal inputs there um, in the vineyard. And then when you bring it into the winery, um, the grapes are fermented with ambient yeast. So there's yeast on the grape skins and then those start fermentation. And then when alcohol, you know, gets to two or 3%, those die because they can't handle the high alcohol and Saccharomyces in the cellar, like kind of like if you have a sourdough starter, you know, falls into the fermentation and um, ferments the rest. And then the other ideas are, you know, very little to no uh, sulfur. And if, if there is some sulfur dioxide added, that's the only preservative. So no kind of, no adding powders to adjust the juice and the flavor and no, um, you know, adding powders to remove, like fine out certain things. So, um, so yeah, and for me, I think about it as like, if I'd been drinking bottled water my whole life and then I realized that I could turn on a faucet and have the most delicious clean spring water, I'd be like, why was I paying for bottled water the whole time? I feel like I have natural winemaking where it's like, the grape is a little winemaking kit. It has all the things it needs to make wine. Why are we like adding and sub subtracting? And like, I don't know. After a while you mix the paint so much, you just make brown. <laughs> I, like, I like both of those last two analogies. Is there anything there for you, Vanessa, uh, that you would add or subtract? I mean, look, I and and no judgment to everybody. This is part of why we do this is because there are so many viewpoints on many things around the natural wine movement. I'm just curious if there, uh, for you, there are also these kind of tenets, the baseline that needs to. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you actually nailed it earlier when you were talking about stocking a wine shop and wanting to have the $14 bottle that someone could grab and go and know that, oh, this is fine, this will work. And that's not what natural winemakers do. <laughs> They're not like, I'm gonna go make a shit ton of money and be super rich because I'm making wine. Like that is not their goal. That's not what they're gonna do. A lot of them are very much artists. They're all scientists. You have to be a scientist. Martha alluded to it, talking about the yeasts and things that it's hard for us to even understand because she's a scientist. 
And you have to be super curious and interested in these different grapes. And there's so many wineries that produce natural wine that do not produce the same wine year after year for the very reason that they don't do anything to manipulate the wine uh, to like a, you know, artificial level. And so if a wine is not right, or if the grapes don't look right, they won't make it, you know, and that's kind of like one of those things that's amazing. And then also they're always looking to do different things. And this is just from my experience watching and being in the industry and seeing the different natural winemakers that I really admire and who I love and the wines that I love drinking. This is my observation of what I've seen of what they do and how they do it. And each vintage is gonna always have some variation to it because our climate varies from vintage to vintage. The time that you pick varies from vintage to vintage. You know, the different things that are happening with the sun and the soil and everything else varies. Also winemaking techniques. So a lot of natural winemakers because they're not putting chemicals in their wine they use a lot of different techniques different vessels as ways to manipulate the wine but in a lower intervention way so it's not actually transitioning the juice in a chemical way exactly again i'm not a scientist but they you know they'll use stainless steel so it doesn't impart a lot of flavor into the wine or they'll use like a, a certain type of oak that might impart a certain neutrality or flavor, you know? Um, and so that's, those are the types of things. Also carbonic maceration is something that I do feel like, you know, a lot of natural winemakers, it's a, it's a winemaking style that they started to really popularize, make po more popular. Those people enjoy those wines. There's been a lot of discussion about carbonic maceration. I'm happy to have a discussion with you about it, but I just really like drinking wine. So for me, I'm like, I don't, if someone wants to use carbonic or not, then I'm not going to say that's not a the right way to make wine. Um, if the wine tastes delicious and I know that they weren't putting a bunch of chemicals in my wine, I'm like, do it. So for people that don't know what carbonic maceration is, basically it's just a whole cluster of ferm fermentation and there's, a, there's CO2 that's generally added to the vessel as the wine is being fermented inside its own little grape. Um, and then there's ways to to do like a semi-carbonic where they let more oxygen in and do other things. Again, Martha could get more specific about it, but that's just a good example of a way that natural winemakers do add their own spin and their own techniques on wine without adding chemicals and while still using native yeasts and while also sourcing the best grapes, the organically grown grapes. Um, so, so yeah, I think for me, it's funny because I think that's why I'm so passionate about working with winemakers that make wine like this is because I know that they're not just like, the, it's, it's their lifestyle. It's who they want to be as a person. They're not just like, I would like to drive like a couple Lamborghinis, <laughs> you know? I mean, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying that I wouldn't mind dream, driving a Lamborghini for a weekend. <laughs> I would imagine the car insurance would be astronomical. Right, yeah, like at a certain one, point. You own one Lamborghini, just for the record. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a good point that you brought up about um, the fact that I think people confuse low intervention or hands-off as doing nothing, right? Because you always face decisions in the cellar. Um, it's kind of like, this is a terrible analogy, but stick with me here. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you've got a, you've got a creek and you want to, you basically need to figure out a way to make that creek flow naturally and flow to the right landing spot in a pond or a lake. I don't really know how creeks work, but let's pretend that that's how they work. Uh, and you have two choices of how to get them there. You can basically bulldoze a path, like right, you know, right through the dirt, right through the land uh, and direct it exactly where you want it to go. Or you can kind of work with the land, work with the erosion patterns, work with the rocks to kind of direct water force in the general way while still letting the current dictate where things ultimately end up. And it's kind of what I've always struggled with uh, the, the definitions that we have about natural wine, about you know no, lo, low intervention, where it's like, well, guess what? We harvested the grapes, we transported them, in, in trucks or wheelies <laughs> or wheelbarrows, we brought them into a winery. We put them in a thing. Uh, we, you know, and and one step after another and after another. And so, uh, 
I, I'm very, I, I've always tried to narrow down a little bit into what these terms actually mean uh, and, and how these decisions are made. And I think a big thing for me with that is transparency uh, of what is done, what is added, and this is not just for natural wine, by the way. I'm not just holding. Yeah, it it should, to, I would uh, love to have to a standard. I, there should be ingredient lists on all wine. I mean, hello, uh, yeah. you know. I agree. Yeah, I agree, a hundred percent. And so let's talk for a moment about what might uh, intimidate people about natural wine, or m really more likely, why the American wine industry and the the sales apparatus of the American wine industry sometimes myself included, love to give the natural wine movement endless amounts of shit. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it is, this is kind of spurred by a question that came in from Rob and actually the question that Noah posed as well, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, Rob wrote down, uh, with some, maybe most natural wines, they tend to be funky and wild, which we love. Is this a byproduct of making natural wine or a target? And so I'm, this is the thing that anybody who sells wine struggles with, whether you're selling wine in a restaurant, online, in a retail shop, is how, like, you almost have to warn people if they are trying natural wine for the first time, hey, this is not going to be like a lot of the wines you've tried. Yeah, but it's hard because no. it's like when you ask a waiter or, sorry, server at a restaurant, like, well, how spicy is it? Mm. It's like, well, how, how, what's your spice tolerance? And it, it's like, how do you even describe it? You're like, well, five chilies. And you're like, is that out of 20 or is that out of, you know? And, and I feel that way about funk and natural wine. So it's funny, you know, certain wines that I, and it depends, like I share a winemaking facility um, with a few others and I've shared now three facilities in my, you know, uh, existence as Martha Stuman Wines. Um, so kind of cooperative spaces. And it's always really fun to see how other um, winemakers approach things. The In all of these facilities, there was kind of this baseline that everyone had, it, had to use uh, native yeast. So that was kind of this like, you know, straight up baseline. But there are so many different expressions within that and, you know, different levels on the funk meter. And so you know, to answer your question about whether it's a target or a byproduct, it's like kind of- is, a, it an, is it just like an accepted byproduct? Like it's gonna happen and it's what, like it is a byproduct in that sense, but it's also what makes this style and this category, it's kind of part of the identity. It's not the identity, but it's part of it and it's in, inescapable. So it's both, right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a chicken or the egg thing where sometimes, you know, I, th I taste something and I'm like, oh, that's a little too, too boring. It's like a little too polished. Like it needs a few edges. I think about my um, husband who writes music, he composes music and he um, does a lot of his music on synthesizers. And he's talking about, you know, when you actually start making music on machines, you can get to a point where it doesn't sound as beautiful because there's not these little distortions that are like, show us that we're human. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but you know, in all of these different facilities that I've been in, there are other ways besides fermenting things natively. That's often where the funk comes from, but what's your temperature control and how much sulfur are you using and what point in the process are you using it? You know, are you filtering? I do filter some of my wines, which I think the like strict, strict dogmatic natural wine police would kick me out of the group for, but <laughs> not all of them. But anyway, it's like, you know, the funk is, when you make natural wines too, you have to accept that like with more conventional wines, you, f you kind of freeze the frame when it's going into bottle, but with natural wines, you don't do that. You know that the wine's been developing and it's living and you're leaving all of this microbiology in the wine before it goes into bottle. And so, you know, it kind of lives beyond you when you send it out into the world and so you don't always know even like, you know, it may taste very, very clean and it might get a little more funky and maybe it ends up being more delicious that way too. So it's hard. I think part of what, um, especially older generally men in the wine sales industry have struggled with is they, is the idea of wine flaws, right? Uh, and, and there are, there are certain 
things that we have we have defined as a flaw in a wine. I mean, first of all, the, the big one is like cork taint, TCA. You open up a bottle and it smells like wet cardboard or possibly even worse than that, uh, which to me, I don't know what could be worse than wet cardboard. It literally haunts my dreams. Uh, but, you know, so so there, there are certain things like that where something happened, very specific, uh, and then you have other things like Brett, like the VA, uh, and, and the like, and Mouse. so and mousiness, and so we all have different. Oh no! We all have different <laughs> tolerances for for flaws, right? I have famously said I don't mind VA, generally speaking. Like, I, I mean, look, if it's off the rails, uh, it's really hard to deal with. But like, I drink Nebbiolo, I drink Sangiovese, and if you don't like VA, you can't drink. Barolo, you can't drink Chianti. You can't, like, it's impossible. Um, and Brett, kind of the same thing. If you, if you want to drink Syrah from the Northern Rhone, you better kind of be okay with a little bit of Brett. Uh, and what I think there's been pushback on is that these flaws, some people say, I, I, I don't know if I'm one of these people, but some people, the hypothetical some people, say that these flaws are excused in the wine and in the natural wine movement uh, as just a byproduct and part of the deal uh, where they, the critics might say that it is a result of uh, dirty or, or uh, unresponsive winemaking. What, what is it when you hear somebody, Vanessa, somebody who's spent a lot of time in working with consumer to winery side of things, like when you hear that, what's your reaction? I mean, so I think it's just like with other things in this world is you cannot judge natural wine by the most extreme examples of it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of kind of, as you would describe, like funky wines, wines that are not like super delicious. I've had lots of them and honestly enjoyed the experience because I'm like, oh, huh, that's weird. They made it like this and it's kind of okay. Unfortunately, like as I get older, I get really sensitive to mouse. So mouse does like really destroy a wine for me, which is super unfortunate, which is why I kind of was like, oh no. The, and you know, the zero zero wine movement, which we haven't really talked about more because there's, there's that very extreme dogmatic zero zero wine, which is essentially uh, nothing in, nothing out is how they describe it. So to kind of harken back to what you were saying about picking the grapes and driving them to the winery and like, how can you say it's low intervention because you're doing all this stuff? Well, people talk about zero zero. How can you really say nothing in, nothing out when you're like doing all this stuff? But I'm kind of digressing. Um, so the zero zero is like the far edge of the natural wine where they're just really dogmatic. And if there's mouse in the house, they do nothing about it. And like, I think if you inch back in to natural winemakers who still like really want to make sure that their wine are, wine is palatable and delicious and amazing, like Brock, like Martha, there's choices that are made in the cellar about adding a small trace amount of sulfur. I mean, we're talking about super minimal and there, especially in the past like five, seven years, there's been a lot of discussion about the amount of sulfur added to wine and the natural winemakers that do add sulfur tend to add such a little amount in comparison to winemakers that are making wine for money. <laughs> or even like dried fruit, cereal. Like yeah, all, all I didn't, the... yeah, exactly. Dried fruit, <laughs> totally dried apricots. Don't even talk to me about sulfur, right? <laughs> but, you know, Martha really brought up a great point about natural wine. And what's amazing is that it is a living organism in the bottle. So, so we enjoyed a Sangiovese that was from Baraccio in Australia. And when we opened that up and enjoyed that together, you and me, Will, William, we both were like, what? Our mind was blown. It was so obvious that this wine had been just living there in that bottle, just like a slight effervescence, which would totally be considered a flaw, right? Yeah. By normal, I guess, sommeliers or whatever. And um, I, I don't even know what the terms are anymore, you know? Um, but for us, it was so enjoyable. And you have had so many wines and you were like, this is good, you know? And, <laughs> and, and you know, I'm, I, I come into certain wines with more skepticism yeah. than others. And, and look, I do the same thing on, on the other side of things. Like, you know, 
all these blockbuster cult Napa cabs, they do nothing for me. And I come, I come to them with possibly even more skepticism, but you're right there. And I, and I think this is a point that you were kind of getting to earlier that I think is really interesting. We, as industry people, we are very uh, much able to differentiate between wines that we find just really fascinating and really interesting, Mm -hmm. whether they're delicious or not. And then we have wines that whether they're fascinating and interesting or not are just damn delicious. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical that right now, I think this will change, the general wine drinking public is at a point where they are gonna spend $25 plus on a bottle of wine, open it, find it really fascinating, but not necessarily delicious and be super happy. That's my concern, right? Yeah. So yeah. I... Yeah, sorry, Martha, to cut you off, but it's super interesting because Weinster, your audience is really not the audience that just wants a bargain bottle. They are definitely more, I don't want to use the term sophisticated, but they're more curious. They want to try different things. And that's one of the things that has been your kind of guiding light in a lot of ways with Weinster um, is, is actually showcasing some of these more interesting different wines, but you obviously are a gatekeeper and making sure that they taste great and that someone who might not be as used to certain types of um, intrigue um, won't actually be super turned off by any of the bottles that you provide. Like that's the whole service of Weinster. And it's really, obviously it's, it's, it's very elemental in the Nero and the Valdigui. So the Nero from Martha and the Valdigui from Brock, these are both super approachable, like delicious wines. No one's going to be like, this wine is terrible. You know, everyone's going to enjoy it. And it's just like almost icing on the cake that it's a natural wine. Mm, Yeah. I I, ha- I think it was Martha when Laura, Lauren still worked with you uh, where we were talking about the post-fertation white. And I was like, look, I love it. And a lot of our customers love it, but it's, it's a 50-50 split, which is totally fine because people would always be writing in like, oh my God, there's sediment. Is something wrong with the bottle? And, and what is great about having a customer base, whether you're a restaurant, a retailer, whatever you are, uh, where you have a customer base that brings those questions to you is you have a chance to uh, use that as an educational moment of being like, actually, you know, X, Y, and Z about sediment. Actually, this wine might taste this way because of this. Uh, and that's what uh, I really, really enjoyed about having the chance to kind of uh, really be on the ground floor and like see what people uh, are saying about these wines. Yeah, which is awesome. And that actually was really good feedback for me. I ended up... Um, filtering it the next year. Cause I was curious. I was like, okay, yeah, it does. I mean, the sediment doesn't bother me. It doesn't like turn me off in any way. Um, there's a grape in it, you know, the Muscat grape just happens to be kind of a cloudier grape and it doesn't really settle out as nicely. Um, but I filtered it and it was a totally different expression. Um, and it's hard. I flip flop. I don't know what I'm going to do this year in terms of whether I'm going to filter it or not filter it because, you know, I really, really, really liked it both ways. So I even felt 50-50 split. It's it's interesting, but yeah, I hope that it was an educational moment for people and that people could, I don't know. Yeah, Uh, at the end of the day, you know, what does it taste like to you and do you enjoy it? That's, That's the most important part of it. And, you know, whether you're trained or not to recognize flaws, like let's try to peel a little bit of that away you know, in our psyche. And yet, and yet I agree with you, Vanessa, I, the mouse, I'm like, it's for, oh, for everyone who's listening, I don't think we explained what mouse. We we didn't, no. Mouse taint, (laughs) like, what are we talking about mouse? Mouse taint is a terrible name for a flaw that I, I think, or a phenomenon. I'm going to try, I try to like steer away from flaw because it's, that's a very qualitative or like a, a very, um, subjective thing. Um, but it's, it's something where if you don't add any sulfur, you can get, um, sometimes you can get this flavor that is like an aftertaste. Um, it's actually really crazy not to get super like nerdy scientific on you again, but it's, Please do. <laughs> it's the, the way, so mouse, you can't smell it. Um, 
And wine is acidic, so it has a lower pH. And when you put it in your mouth, your saliva actually raises the pH and it liberates, it like makes this uh, aroma volatile. So it like liberates this aroma in your mouth. So some people can't taste it depending on what, how acidic your saliva is or not, which is crazy. So um, anyway, but it tastes kind of like, for me, it tastes kind of like rancid hazelnuts or like weird, gross, Sear like really rotten cereal or something. I don't know. Mm. People say it tastes like mouse cage, which is where the name came from. Yeah, I have a I have a very specific callback. It's uh, rancid grape nuts cereal. Oh. Uh, hundred percent from my childhood. I have that like locked in my brain. Um, my dad was not the best with like. I don't think he's on here tonight, so I can say this. Uh, he had a really bad habit with like leaving the cereal in the cabinet for just months and months and possibly years and years. Uh, but yeah, rancid grape nuts is, is kind of my callback for, for mouse. Um, yeah, we've, we've got about five minutes left and there are two more questions that I want to make sure that I ask you guys. Uh, and one of them is from Noah in the chat. Uh, he thanks all of us for being here. Thank you, Noah, for being here. Um, I have a question. Is natural wine more healthy? Will I not get a hangover? I love this question because anytime people bring up natural wine, to me at least, off, they will bring up the wellness movement or idea. Uh, and so, so that I do not derail the final five minutes of this uh, Zoom with just swearing and shouting, I will throw <laughs> this. Uh, let's, let's start with you, Vanessa. Um, can you get hung over on natural wine and is it healthy for you? Yes, you can get hung over on natural <laughs> wine. Hello, people. How much are you drinking? Um, it has alcohol on, in it, you know. Um, now, do I feel like I get less? Uh, like sometimes if, if I drink like a, a full big glass of a big old cab that I know probably has a ton of sulfur and maybe some other gross stuff in it. Do I get like a headache the next day, no matter what, no matter if I only had one glass, probably. Um, so I definitely feel like for me personally, I can drink more or I can have as much as I want and it's not as bad. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's really not about like the end effect. It's more about what we talked about before. Like, do you want to drink something made with organic grapes that doesn't have a bunch of additives? Or would you prefer to drink something that's like completely manipulative with commercial yeast added and ascorbic acid and like all that weird stuff? So. That's fair. That answers, that's fair. Yeah. No, it, it, it totally does. It's kind of strange that we've gotten to a point where people say uh, drinking alcohol, no matter the quantity is good for you. Um, <laughs> Is there anything to that, Martha, that you would like to add about hangovers or wellness surrounding uh, drinking natural wine? Yeah, I mean, I think what you said before, William, about transparency, and you agreed with Vanessa, is just like, that way people can kind of decide for themselves. I mean, there are things that can get added to wine. There's a lot of like animal products um, that are used as, as fining agents. So you know, things derived from pork, um, fish air bladders, there's um, egg white proteins that can be added, there's um, milk proteins. So like, you know, if you are, if you do have some allergies, uh, that's a potential problem for you. And you will, you will, like your body will ex help, you know, experience that in a negative way. Um, sulfur as well. I mean, the, the higher the, the level, I think I've you know, found myself <laughs> with a few more, a um, few more headaches, but there's just, it's so hard when you don't know exactly what's in the wine to yeah. really say. And yeah. yeah, I do think the point is at the end of the day, it, there's alcohol in it. Alcohol <laughs> is poisonous at large quantities. So, um, I've tested the limits. All right. I can attest. <laughs> but it's so no enjoyable matter. too. So yeah, I think focusing on like, yeah, all the things leading up to it, like, you know, at the end of the day, I make wine to like bring pleasure to the world. And I just don't think it should come at like an environmental cost or, or a human cost. The people who are out in the vineyard spraying all the shit. Sorry. The stuff. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. So at a certain point, uh, it, it can't just be about whether I get headaches or not, because you're right. Like number one, we don't know all that's in some of these wines that give people headaches. There's a lot of studies done just about the histamine reactions that you can have just to tannin 
right? Like super tannic grapes who can uh, naturally give people headaches from that and all the other crap that's thrown in there. It's not just about one thing or another. And also, since it's not a wellness product, it's about, like to me, it's about uh, finding and supporting certain kind of approaches to things you consume and making sure that at least your dollar will not be the reason why they're not viable, right? So like for me, and this kind of ties into the last question, I am a monthly subscriber to Hiu Wine Farm. So I get one bottle a month shipped twice a year. And I gotta be honest, those wines are super challenging for me. They really push the limits of like what I can handle, but they fascinate me. And everything that they're doing fascinates me. And I want to make sure that at the very least, when I say that I want to see more regenerative agriculture, when I want to see people pushing the limits with where they're farming and how they're farming, that my dollar backs that up. And so my dollar goes to some, you know, to, to high you, you know, what, 45 bucks a month or whatever. So that kind of ties into my question that I want to wrap this up with. Uh, and we'll start with Vanessa and with Martha. What, uh, if, if people enjoy these wines and, and natural wine in general, what is a producer uh, anywhere in the world uh, that you really would recommend they check out that you're really excited about right now? And they don't have to be on Winestar? No, no, God no. Um, so I think one of the mo most exciting, actually, and, and he's been one of my favorites for the last year, I would say, is Flores Wines, um, mm. he's based in Santa Cruz. Um, and if you go to his website, he describes it as dedicated to elemental practices, which I think is a really nice way of, of talking about natural wine, because it's just like getting back to basics. All of the things, the thing about natural wine and about the wines that we make and about wines that are really special and stick out to me is that there's just something about the 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 passion of the winemaker that they infuse in their wine that you can tell from drinking that wine. Um, and so, yeah, I would definitely go check out Flores. I know he has his website up right now, um, selling wine. Not all small producers have online wine sales available. And he's also has like distribution and stuff, but I really love his whites, his Chardonnay, um, his it's called moon milk is his Chardonnay and his Sabi B. So good. Awesome. That's crazy that you shouted him out because I was thinking I wanted to shout out, um, Megan who, oh. Yeah, Virgin Wines, and they actually operate out of the same facility. So um, I'm actually drinking her Sangiovese right now, which is like, she just makes these juicy, lush, but not like heavy wines that are just so incredible. And I have a soft spot for, you know, women who really came to the wine world without any funding and really like pulled themselves up with anybody, not just women, but like who pulled themselves up, you know, by their bootstraps. And, you know, as uh, I think, what is it? 4% of all, it's only 4% of all wineries in California are owned and, um, and actually the winemaker is a woman. So owned and, and winemaker. So it's a teeny, mar you know, teeny, teeny yeah. little finger. So it's really cool. It's obviously hard to do. Um, it's really cool that she's done it. And yeah, love the wines. And they work out of the same winery. So that is super weird. I know. I love it. But I Santa, love it. Santa Cruz Mountains is really magic. So yeah. Yeah, it feels like Santa Cruz is kind of, Santa Cruz Mountains in particular having their, uh, their Santa Rita Hills moment right now where everybody realizes that A, they exist uh, and B, you know, the, the, and, and I have been around for a while. And, and uh, I, like when you speak of historical vineyards, I mean, uh, Santa Cruz uh, Mountains in particular have had a, a say in the history of the California wine business uh, and, and development. So, all right, with that said, uh, it is just over an hour. I, this was awesome. I had so much fun. Uh, and I hope everybody at home enjoyed this, enjoyed the wealth of information that Martha and Vanessa shared tonight. Um, if you guys have any questions that we didn't get to, feel free to write into our customer service uh, and we'll make sure to pass those along uh, and get those figured out for you. Drink these wines, buy these wines, buy more wines from them. Uh, they're, they're certainly available uh, on their websites and uh, Rob encouraged us to check out Avani Syrah in Mornington Peninsula. Hey, Australia, I used to be a huge hater on Australian wine uh, and I have recently come around. I know I'm the worst. 
Uh, it was like, you know, you're like living in your New York. You're like, I only drink French and Italian wines, you know, like, and, and eventually you, and eventually you realize that you're just full of it and there's a ton of really good wine coming from Australia. Uh, but anyways, with that in mind, thank you guys so much. Uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, coming and joining us tonight. It was great. Of course. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. Good to see you. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Uh, care. And I hope everybody who tuned in tunes in uh, next week. We've got uh, a couple more great wines for uh, Red Blends of the New World. So we'll see you then. Take care. Awesome.